So when Bach found the first of these remedies, you remember he prepared them from the seeds and he prepared them homeopathically. And they had some beneficial effect because he kept on working with the discovery of the 12 and then the 7. But at quite an early stage, he decided that he needed to prepare the remedies in a different way. And I'm not entirely sure what prompted this, because once you see how he's doing it, it makes complete sense. So there was something that he wasn't quite satisfied with in homeopathy. He makes the comment at one point that there's a problem of polarity. And this is, I suppose, what happens with, um, with homeopathic remedies, that if you take, for the sake of argument, let's take arsenic, which is a poison, and in its gross form, if you take it, or its physical form, it will give you a set of symptoms which are very serious, like you'll get poisoned. <laughs> but if it's uh, in serial dilution and succussion, as is done with making of homeopathic remedies, there comes a point where it crosses the fulcrum and it changes from being a poison into an agent of stimulating what Hahnemann, Hahnemann calls a Lebenskraft, I think, which is the life force and vitality of the person taking the remedy, and it, it becomes a stimulus to uh, actually counteract or change the symptom picture that the remedy is for. So, at this point, we speak in homeopathy of about 5x or whatever it is, of potencies of, of changing from the physical form to, to serial dilution, one part in a hundred thousand, there's no more, longer the physical stuff there, there's just the information in the homeopathic liquid, which is then used to potentize the granules or pillules. So this is where he started, and he says this, this obviously there is a polarity here between, if you will, the, the negative and the positive. Now, he's not happy with this, and it's not entirely clear why. Because if the remedies were working and he was getting a result, why does he want to change them? Perhaps it is quite simply that he wants to... Oh, maybe he, it is again at the action of intuition and uh, a sense of following um, what, what comes towards him. This, uh, what did you call it? A sense of... Trust. A sense of trust. Trusting in what you're being shown. Because if he sees this and it inspires him, inspire takes in. So from the outside he inspires the idea that there's a different way to go, then he's following the true path of discovery. He's not imposing an idea, he's revealing an idea. And the idea that he has is, well, at that fulcrum, at that point where the change of state occurs, at that point the forces are entirely vertical. They're not, in other words, there's no turning moment, there's no process of change. There, it's entirely what is coming from the higher levels, let's say. Bach goes on to speak about uh, these remedies flooding us with their healing vibrations. So he has an idea of what comes from the light into the physical level. What comes from the fire down through air, water to earth. It's a process of descending energy, or energy which is coming down to earth. And this leads him, Nora Weeks again, don't forget, she's the only real source of information we have on this, but she says he was in North Wales, in Bilth Wales, in Wales, I think it was there, and he saw that the dew on the flowers in the morning, in the sunlight, was sparkling with light, and he thinks they must somehow absorb the energetic properties of the plant. And this is what leads him to him to think like this. That may be an explanation of what triggers it. But this is actually what happened. He took 
a thin glass bowl. What does it look like? Not like that. It looks like this. This is a thin glass bowl. It's actually a finger bowl, which in the 1930s, if you went to posh dinners and you had crab or some kind of meat that you'd used to eat with your fingers, they would bring you a finger bowl so that you could wash your fingers in a nice dainty way and you'd get rid of the, you know, the sort of uh, oil or the, 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 uh, the mess. So he was familiar with these. Oddly enough, Mrs. Beaton, the famous sort of doyen of, of Victorian household management, she talks about using these and, funnily enough, talks about floating flowers on the surface of the water of a finger bowl. So it could even be that he'd seen on a table a finger bowl like this with flowers floating on it at one of his Masonic dinners when he had this brilliant idea about the 12 types. Why not? It doesn't matter where the idea comes from, it's whether or not we pick up on it that's important. If we're awake and something comes towards us and we see it, we observe it. Luciano was talking about we look but we don't see. Okay, We have our eyes open but we don't see what's being shown to us. The difference with Bach is he sees it and he makes use of it as a means of what? He's going to record the information that comes from the flowers. So in this process, which he calls the sun method, he floats the flowers on the surface of the water and leaves it in the sunlight for about three hours. Now, some people have made the sort of suggestion that this is a secret process, that you could patent it, or it was some kind of thing which was owned, that there was ownership of the subject of Bach and Bach flower remedies. Well, it's such a notion is an absolute... Actually, it's a joke. <laughs> because whenever he published, whenever he discovered something, he immediately published all the information about how to do it. And there you have it, in his own book, the Twelve Healers, he lists the remedies, he describes the remedies, and there he says, methods of preparation, method of preparation, yes, I can read it from the back, the sun method. So he's immediately telling everybody how to do it. There's a no trade secret there. What actually he says is this. A thin glass bowl is taken and almost filled with the purest water obtainable, if possible from a spring nearby. The blossoms of the plant are picked and immediately floated on the surface of the water so as to cover it, and then left in the bright sunshine for three or four hours, or less time if the blooms show signs of fading. The blossoms are then carefully lifted out and the water poured into bottles so as to half fill them the bottles are then filled up with brandy to preserve the remedy. These are his words, word for word. This is a, a facsimile edition of the 1936 uh, printing of his book, The Twelve Healers and Other Remedies. So, he's very explicit. And if we were to make a description of how to make the remedy today, and I've made these remedies many, many, many times, hundreds of times, I would say... I could not improve on his words because they are so succinct and so clear. What we do is to get fresh spring water. Now, for me at Healing Herbs, where I'm making the essences, I think it's very important to have water that comes freshly, newly, newborn out of the ground from a, a spring, and it's used, <coughs> and it's used immediately so that it actually has had no contact with anything other than the flowers and the bowl in that moment when they're put out on the ground. The flowers themselves, it's important that these are at the height of the flowering. We use flowers that are newly opened. The reason for that is when, when, the, when the flower opens just before pollination or at the time of pollination, it's actually in a moment between worlds because it's about to become 
a seed. <laughs> it's, it's going to be pollinated. That moment of conception, we say, that's when the, the male gametes meet the female eggs or whatever they are. I mean, in the case of a, a plant, it's not an egg as such, but it will become a seed. So these flowers are, let's say, they, they carry the impression or they carry the information of what the future of the plant will be. Remember back to the seed. The seed is the condensing of the information and potential for life that's within the plant. And with a flower, it's the information for the potential of making that seed. When it's put into the, the sunlight, at the beginning, it's very interesting to watch this, and uh, many different people have made the same observation. So I'm describing something which you could see if you chose to do the same thing. At the beginning, usually, because the water is colder than the surrounding air, the first thing is that the surface of the bowl condenses and looks sort of frosted. The flowers carry the brilliance and the light. But after a period of time, and it depends how strong the sun is, several things happen. The temperature of the water rises, and it, the, the, the light and brilliance which is in the flowers slowly fades. Remember he said, take it for less time if the blooms show signs of fading, so he's observed this. And inside the bowl with the water, little bubbles of air are expressed out from the water and they, they hang inside the bowl. So the action of the sunlight, the action of fire, acting on the flowers, coming into the water, has the effect of breaking air out of the water and taking it up to the surface eventually. And the other thing that happens is that this light that is in the water, it starts to shine. Now, there's no, there's no logical way in terms of science to explain what's going on here. Or at least not one that I understand the science of. But this is the science of observation. I'm telling you what happens. And anybody can see this because at a certain point the, the light that is in the bowl is so intense that it starts to shine out from the bowl and you can see it, it's, it's, it's quite palpable, the, uh, the energy that has been written into the water. Except, it's not energy. Energy has done the writing, but what is in the water now is information. Why is it not energy? If it was energy, you could measure it. It would actually have something, a voltage or some, some uh, measurable quantity which had changed. And of course, energy has entered the water, which is why the temperature goes up. But when we complete the remedy, as he describes it, and take the flowers off very carefully using a twig from the same plant, and we then just have the, the water, the temperature drops back down again. And this is why you must have uninterrupted sunlight, because the moment the clouds come over the sun, the temperature of the water starts to drop. And it's got to go up, 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 as this information is written in. And then when the temperature comes back down again, the energy is given off because heat leaves the bowl, but the information stays within the water. And that information is what makes the remedy. So when a drop or a small amount of this is taken by somebody, they're actually getting information. What is that information, if you like, what is it saying? Its message is to the sclerancer's person, why don't you try to look up and see how to make a choice? <laughs> or in the case of somebody who's frightened, a mimulus type of person, the information might say, if you step forward 
you'll find that your fears actually are not as real as you imagine. It's not necessarily going to be as bad as you think, because it's thinking that makes it uh, an issue of fear in many cases. In the case of the Empathians person, it's saying, instead of tensing up, you could relax, just like the flower. Let the flower tell you how to relax. So, what we have, I'm going to go over the top of this diagram now, is the sunlight. And that rays down, it's rather a good place to put it, on that point of the fulcrum where the vertical forces are actually raying down upon the surface of the earth. And this then is, we call this the mother essence or mother tincture. And that's mixed with 50, 50, with brandy. I mean, at, at Healing Herbs we use a very good quality organic brandy, but the real purpose of the brandy is to just preserve the water. Because if it's left alone, it will in time grow green slime or whatever else may be there in some form. And so the brandy, which will make it up to a 20% alcohol solution, is there just to keep it clear and to support, let's say, the remedy, but it doesn't take an active part in it. So this is Bach's Sun Method, and uh, it's been very widely applied by others who have followed on after Bach in discovering other flower remedies, flower essences, people in California, for instance, uh, at the Flower Essence Society, they use the sun method. And it's widely seen as uh, a means of, um, I'm going to say extracting, but it's not extracting, it's, it's a means of recording the information that's in the plant. Now it's noticeable that Bach says, you must go to where the plants grow, because the information that's going into the bowl isn't just the flowers. It's actually the time, the place, the atmospheric pressure, all the factors that kind of are part of the experience of those three hours. So that's a wide, uh, a wide pattern of information is recorded in this one process. And the, but the most important thing that's recorded is the uh, form which is in the form of information, the form of the plant, as it expresses an idea. I suppose, really, at this stage, it would be helpful to quickly go on and talk a little bit about what actually happens when you take a remedy, and what's the process, because, as I said at the beginning, most people think with bark flower remedies you're talking about what comes in a little brown bottle and how does how does it go from there to here to me there are really three stages in making the uh, mother the the uh, bark flower remedies there's the bowl the sun and that we said 50-50 with brandy equals the mother, doesn't matter, mother essence, mother tincture, it's the same thing. Now when, when we prepare the stock bottles, which is this, this is a stock bottle, we're taking into doesn't look quite right that bottle, but still, you know, you can see what I mean. We're taking two drops of this in 30 mils of brandy. When I say taking, I mean we're putting it into here. So that's the first stage of dilution. This is the second stage of dilution. Now clearly you can't put two-thirds of a drop into a 10ml bottle. So actually 
we've calculated this by means of um, repeated experimentation and if you take these two drops and you put it into 30 mils it's the equivalent to one part in 400 so there are 800 drops in a 30 mil bottle approximately now this is somewhat contentious because the size of a drop varies according to the specific gravity of the liquid water as opposed to alcohol and it also is slightly dependent on the size of the pipette which you're using to drop so it's a kind of it's a, a, a roundabout that and it's not an exact proportion and the reason that that's uh, relevant in this situation is that you're not taking a quantity you're actually passing on information because the information which is in the bowl is in the drop is then transferred from liquid to liquid in the stock bottle when we you, I, come to take this, we put two drops from here, little squeezy pipette, either into, gosh, I'm going to have to improve my drawing, into a dosage bottle or into a glass of water. It's the same thing and so this is, uh, where should we put it, dosage strength. That's the third level of dilution. Now you may wonder whether this is the same as other people have told and explained, but this three-part dilution is very specifically talked about by Nora Weeks in the book she wrote in 1964, called Bart Flower Remedies Illustration and Preparation. Now Nora Weeks was one of Bart's assistants and uh, I think we can say if she said that's how to do it and those are the three stages we can say that's the classic original way to dilute Bart Flower Remedies. Anybody who tells you that that's part one and this is part two and then this makes you part three it's nonsense. It's very clear three stages of uh, dilution and again just as here what you're putting in there is not a quantity but a quality when it's coming down to this level of dilution it's still just the the quality of the information that's going into the bottle so it's the same message that's consistently working through these levels well what actually happens? Let me show you. <laughs> There's my glass of water. This is five flower. So I put two, I could put three or four. It's not important. It doesn't get better if I take it direct from the bottle. It doesn't get stronger. I could take ten drops and it wouldn't make any difference. And then you sip it. Now the point about this is that let's say the information that's coming into me now um, let's imagine a situation. I'm, uh, I'm walking out into the road and there's a car coming but I'm looking, I'm reading a book so I'm, I'm not looking where I'm going and you shout to me and say stop Oh, that's information, as there's a result in me in action. If I hear it, if I don't hear it, it's not going to have any effect at all, you shouting at me, is it? You'll actually have to come and push me out of the way. But if I hear it, it produces an immediate result. And the question really, when you're taking bio remedies, is what is your aptitude and what is your facility? first of all to hear the message and then to do something about it. Let's say I'm coming towards the road and this time I'm a child on a push bike and I don't know how to operate the brakes. You can shout at me, stop Julian, but if I don't know how to put on the brakes I'm still going to go into the road. I've had the warning but I haven't done anything about it. So 
The other component when it comes to taking a remedy is me or you, if it's your essence that is being taken, you know, that you're taking a remedy for yourself. Ah, interestingly, when we were here, I'm saying that the energy, the radiant energy of the sun, is what writes the information into the water, but then the energy is not present in the remedy. It's just information. Where does the energy come from when it comes to activating this, which you could call this a passive force field? Something to go into another time, perhaps. But where does the energy come from if I'm taking the remedy? Where does it come from to activate this information? Well, it comes from me. I'm the energy. This is the information. I'm actually, and it actually you are, very, very expert at reading this kind of information. What stops me actually responding to it is my conditioning. Like Bach said about people who are chronically ill, they're so used to their disease that it almost appears to be a part of them. So when you say you could actually do something different, I say, well, I don't know how to. You know, what would it be? Let's say I'm really, really used to standing on two feet. And you say to me, lift up one of your legs, Julian. And I said, well, if I lift up my leg, I'm going to fall over. <laughs> because if my mindset is set, no matter what information comes in, I won't respond to it. But if the information coming in starts to loosen the kind of structure of my idea, my attachment to whatever it is, it may be my attachment to illness, Interestingly, Bach talks about this. He says some people have an investment in being ill and you can't help them. So actually the ones that you can help, he says, are those who actually want to change. And if they want to change but don't know how to, then this is going to help bring in, uh, this is going to introduce a new way of thinking, a new way of looking, a new way of feeling and therefore a new way of being. It doesn't matter, according to Bach, because he says treat the person, not the disease, it doesn't matter what's happening in my physical body, because it's all about the mind. We know, and again Bach describes this in his writings, we know that before ever we're ill in the physical body, there are things that start to change in our emotional and mental and spiritual life which are like a foreshadowing of what is going to happen. This came to me, or was pointed out to me many, many years ago when somebody, I went down to their house and uh, said, oh, well, really, really, you're terrible cold at the moment and I don't really want to do any work and said, what happened to you three days ago? I don't know, nothing happened to me three days ago. Well, before you get a cold, you have to have been subject to something that opens you to that. Something has actually interfered with your natural immune response. And I thought and thought and thought, no, I know what happened three days ago. I went to the dentist. And actually, you're right, it was a big shock going to the dentist, because I'd never been to this dentist before. And when I got out of the chair, I thought he was a bit clumsy. He said, thank you very much, Mr. Barnard, you were my first patient ever. <laughs> the, the result of that was that I'd actually been interfered with, let's say. An opening had been made in the natural defences of the body. Let's think back, where were we right at the beginning, with this problem that Bach has, oh here we are, about the syringe entering the body and breaking through the natural defences. When somebody starts to drill into your mouth, you need something to protect you, to help you. And at least that's the way that that was looked at then. It's a good thing to come back to this drawing now because just as my mental attitude can affect and influence the body, 
So what I'm taking in through the remedies has a feedback loop which can change my mind. So it's a mutually uh, reinforcing cycle of either going down or going up. And there isn't really such a place as being entirely stable, neither one way or the other, because things are always in change and in flux. There's a, a lot to unpack in this uh, issue of the relationship between the mind and the body, and between what actually is taking place within the inside the uh, human body and the immune system. There's, a, there's something which is called homeostasis. And basically, my understanding of this is that the natural uh, place for human health is to be well. We've been rather brought up with the idea that the natural thing for us to be is ill. Well, that's because the drug companies would like us to be ill, so that they can sell us lots of things to make us actually more ill, not better, more ill. But it's, it's normal for the, for the human body to be well, and it's the normal thing is for the immune system, through its own defences, to be able to deal with that which comes into it, provided it's allowed to be healthy and allowed to not be subject to uh, the distorting influence of uh, emotional trauma and difficulty or a pattern of behaviour which is disruptive of homeostasis. So what the remedies help to do is to bring us back into balance. If we, sort of, if we can stop the thought pattern which imposes uh, the difficulty, if we can release ourselves from that, then we will naturally be well. That's not to say that disease is our own fault, and it's not to say that everything can be cured. But it's a, a very strong contributing factor to the process of health. Who writes about this? Who gave me this thought? It's Bach. He says, how come when the uh, influenza epidemic strikes Western Europe, after the First World War, how come some people get it, and a lot of people die from it, but others don't get it? Why is that? Well, their immune system somehow doesn't respond, doesn't get caught up in it. Much of what Bach wrote about health and disease, and you can read what he wrote, in collected writings, in his essays, Heal Thyself. It's great, actually. Let's show you that. Heal Thyself, the real, an explanation of the real cause and cure of disease. Ah, that's straightforward, isn't it? What he writes there is about the, the story of our lives and how we Again, how we get put off course, how we get taken away from an understanding of what we should be doing. Should, in the sense of what our inner voice is telling us to do, if only we would listen. And it's not listening that causes the difficulty and takes us into ill health, out of balance, offline, off-centre. 